And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a very special Saturday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. For three hours, we have with our special guest, uh, uh, Mr. Steve Quayle. Folks, you know Steve, uh, stevequayle.com, and Dr. Paul Hegstrom. Dr. Paul Hegstrom is the head of Life Skills International. You can find all kinds of information at lifeskillsintl.org. That's lifeskillsintl.org. We've got a link to his website off of homelandsecurityus.com. He's gracious enough to give us three hours of his very valuable time uh, this Saturday night as he is traveling right now in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, I've got to tell you, folks, visit uh, lifeskillsinternational.com and check out the, the number of products there and, and check out even the uh, the monthly uh, specials that he's got. It's just unbelievable. Uh, there are a lot of resources for people in need and we are all, at this point, I believe, in need. Uh, I can relate to 95% of, in fact, probably 100% of what uh, what Dr. Hexerm has got on his website and certainly will be uh, uh, ordering from him because i got to tell you, it's uh, what a resource. And I want to thank Dr. Hexerm for his time as well as Mr. Steve Quayle for his time and thank uh, uh, Dr. Hexerm for his uh, expertise in, in these all, all of these areas. Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, are, are you there, Steve? Yeah, I'm here. You okay. know, one of the best things to do, and, and I want to share something because I have all of uh, Dr. Hague's from CDs because I know so many times have been frustrated, even the people that I know around me and relate to. Uh, he's got a Bible uh, and the Brain CD set. And look, here's the difference. This isn't just self-help. I call this revelation help. Self-help, usually, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. Now, there is an active participation where you literally, the power of the spoken word, speak into your own life, and Dr. Hagstrom can explain that. But there is, it's so important you understand how the brain works, especially when you're dealing with all of the different mental uh, health subjects that are out there and that are destroying people's lives. You know, this is something that I love. The, 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 the Bible has the answer, and, and the idea of anger, there's the righteous indignation, but then there's the anger that's built out of guilt and, and the difference between guilt and shame. And most of us allow the devil to shame us into becoming so impotent and so non-effective because we can't possibly stand up for Jesus because, hey, I used a bad word or I, I watched something or I shouldn't do it. Uh, explain, if you would, Paul, the neutralization of not only hope but also boldness with guilt and shame. Will you do that? Because I, I'm getting emails of people that, and seriously, you know this from your own, even when you were messed up and when I'm messed up, we love the Lord, but that doesn't mean we, we, we're not subject to, to wrong thinking, to wrong programming into the filters that we've adopted in our lives. Well, and that's true. And, you know, I, I want to say this at the, uh, before we went to break, that, that the Scripture tells us, be ye transformed, not conformed to the world, which means that, that, that salvation and God's ways will trans, literally transform us into another another human being. I, it's it's it, the old passes away, and we have impetus and hope and change. You you can't believe where I've come from, and, and and Steve, you and I have talked very deeply in some of these areas of of my own battles in growing up and and getting out of pornography and getting out of drug addiction and serial adultery and all those kind of things. But but our our redeemer has the transforming ability so that we don't have to live those ways anymore and it does change the brain. That's what's exciting. We're, and, and 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 the Bible wouldn't say be ye transformed if we couldn't do it. So that's available for all of us that so we can be transformed. So one of the things with, with guilt and shame uh is the the human being is was created to deal with guilt, not shame. And we went through a stage, oh, probably 20 years ago when John Bradshaw did a tremendous amount of work on, on shame-based thinking and, and being shamed and those kinds of things. And, and as I watched the church today, uh, they didn't pick up on it. Uh, I, I could name three pastors that are on television that have preached on, the, on shame and guilt and had it so screwed up, it confused me, and that's been one of my studies for years. 
is to understand the difference between guilt, which we can deal with, and shame, which we were never created to deal with. Shame is a foreign thing to us. Uh, that that exists in a dysfunctional situation. But guilt is is like this. Guilt says I made a mistake. Shame says I am a mistake. You see the difference between the two? Oh, yeah. So uh, guilt, again, says I did a bad thing, but shame says I'm bad. Guilt says my behavior was wrong, and shame says I am wrong, and guilt says I have sinned, and shame says I am my sin. That's a biggie, and and until the church gets a hold of that of that piece right there, then it, until the church gets a hold of that, they're not ministering like they should to their their congregations. So, so guilt exists in a system of accountability, learning, growth, and a deepening of values, and the building of a belief system. And and shame exists in a system of perfectionism and leads to the expectation of rejection, rigidity, isolation, despair, being alone, and chained up. I, I use my father-in-law, who has passed on, and I love this guy. He was, he was a terrific man, and he was a man of God. But he was raised in a shame base. So every time we'd go to visit, Judy and I would go to visit her folks, he would come up with some kind of, of theory or something, an opinion or something, and he'd want to debate me. And and I could out debate him in a New York minute. And so if I won the debate, he was so shame based, he says, You know, I and I, and I kept saying, Ben, you're not your opinion, but he thought he was his opinion. So if I if I put his opinion down, then he would walk around the house, you know, uh, chin on the ground and saying, I don't know why God lets me live. There are other people that need the air that I'm breathing worse than I do. He just needs to take me home. And and I, I would kind of laugh at that and say, Ben, it's an opinion, and you are not your opinion. Oh, yes, I am. So if I question his opinion, I question his his existence. And so in in... In the guilt base, I can have an opinion, and you not like my opinion, but I'm okay. I'm still in fact because it's only an opinion. But he was so so set at, at in his nineties that he is his opinion. And and if if I won the won the debate, uh, he was devastated. If I, I I decided one time to try this, let him win. And I'll tell you what, when I let him win, and I just backed off, he was walking around the house whistling, wanted me to stay an extra couple, three days, and we could go fishing or whatever the case may be. He wanted my company because that validated him, his opinion, and to and to accept his opinion, that validated him. And so we're very sensitive in these areas of guilt and shame. Uh, the three, There were three TV pastors that everybody well knows, and I'm not going to teach against them or call them by name or anything, but they said we're going to preach a four-week series on the difference between guilt and shame. Well, the first one did three weeks and got so confused, he confused me. <laughs> and and the second one did the same thing. He got three weeks and confused me. And the third one only made it two weeks, and everything that was shame he was calling guilt because we've not been trained in these areas, but I've studied this for years. And and when it comes down to if I made a mistake, I'm still intact. Even though I made a mistake, I'm still intact. If I did a bad thing, if I if my behavior was wrong or I have sinned, I'm still intact. I'm still redeemable. I'm still valuable. But if I am a mistake and I am my sin, and the way this looks in a church is the pastor gets up and he preaches the truth and talks about certain sins, and, and we all know they are. You can identify them. But but half the congregation goes into a tizzy and gets all upset and says, he's preaching at me, and we need to, we need to get a group together and vote this guy out and get somebody in that preaches love because we don't want to be confronted when we're in a shame base. And so if you question my sin, 
then you're, you're questioning me, and I don't know how to separate the two. But in, in God's way of, of working with our brain, we can, we can sin and still we have value to him and we can, we can, can confess our sin and move forward. Uh, and we can make mistakes. I tell people you're not doing anything if you're not making a mistake now and then because that's how you learn. And I use Thomas Edison when he was doing the light bulb and he had over 10,000 things that he used to try to build a filament and and 10,000 things didn't work. And somebody asked him, he says, well, how's it feel to know there's 10,000 things that won't work? He says, well, now I know what doesn't work, and I will find I'm 10,000 things closer to finding something that does work. Uh, so, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it really affects us if we, if we get locked into that shame base, and yet that's all, that's all changeable, and, and shame is, is, is so foreign to us because it locks us up and says that we have no hope. Shame pulls hope out of it, uh, out of our lives, and and makes us feel like like uh, we have no potential. There's no, there will be no change. This is who I am. You're gonna have to like me for who I am. Those kind of things, and uh, and that's not what it's all about at all. So. Uh, doctor, what are some of the subtle signs of shame-based thinking? Um, yeah, I mean, how could you tell? Uh, for example, you're dealing with with uh, we're dealing with people. Is it easy to t- is it easy to uh, to tell when a person is is rooted in shame-based thinking? I mean, yeah, one of the things that they have trouble looking you in the eye. Oh. They feel that they're less than normal, that they're flawed and defective, and so what happens? Is is their behavior many times is is of self righteousness, always needing to be number one, grandiosity. They're judgmental and critical. They can find your flaws, but you don't dare to talk to them about theirs. They don't want to hear it. So they're judgmental and critical, and and, and that's that's one of the biggest signals of a shame based person is that they have answers for questions that have never been asked. And they will judge your motives and judge your behavior and judge your your agendas and those kind of things. And they actually put you down to build themselves up. That's one of the big areas of shame. Wow. The other area is, uh, some of the other areas is they spend a lot of time in loneliness and isolation because they don't work well with other people. And you can go on the job. I used to be a business consultant for major Fortune 500 corporations, and I could go into a department and look at the people that were unproductive, and they were shame-based people. They 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 would start a project and couldn't finish it. Uh, they would take credit for things that were getting done that they had nothing to do with. They were always self-promoting, always needing to be number one. Um, uh, one of the other things, uh, and just to go through a you know a pretty good list, is over control, which produces chaos. They have to have control. See, and a shame base says that I can't work with others. It has to be my way or the highway, and so they don't have a teachable spirit. Give an example of that. I I worked in a factory one time and did some consulting. And and we had several people that wouldn't read the blueprints because the blueprints were an authority to them. You ever meet somebody like that? You get a bicycle for the kids for Christmas, and they'll put the bicycle together without the blue, without the instructions. They hate the instructions, and they put the bike together and take it apart and put it together and take it apart. Judy and I did that one time when I was in a shame base. I got the girls were less than a year apart, and I got two bicycles alike for them. Judy used the instructions, had the bike together in 20 minutes, and I didn't use the instructions because I felt the instructions were authority, and I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. It took me an hour and 45 minutes to get the bike together, and it still wasn't together right. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's, 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 a, it's a false pride situation. I'm above needing instructions. I'm above authority. See, and wow. so that's one of the dead giveaways when we work with we work with uh, major corporations and go in and, and find out where 
where the money is is being lost, the sieve that's that's letting the money flow through, uh, and you'll find it with shame-based people. They do not work as a team. And then there's always power struggles as to who is right or wrong. They'll sit and argue for two and a half hours over who is right or wrong. And then you'll find out they're people pleasers until they worm their way into your life and into your business or whatever's going on, and and then uh, they will try to please you, but behind your back they fear rejection and there's threats and there's all kind of stuff, of uh, uh, backstabbing, back talk, you know. Uh, they'll they'll please the boss and then talk about him behind his back. So it's it's almost like two personality. And wow. one of the things with the yeah. No, it, it just wow. I, I mean, it, oh. you're, you're just you're describing like uh, the majority of men out there. You know, the the guy who refuses to ask for directions. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. all of us. Uh, we, okay, okay. Which and so is, is this tied to low self esteem? Then I mean, is shame the, the, yeah. the okay? The shame says that I have no value. But see, what happens is when I'm arrested in development and I've never matured and come to the age of decision, my core is is angry and feels defeated, and I feel like I'm flawed and defective, so I develop a pseudo-personality. Let me give you this example. You'll love this one. The pseudo-personality is what I want you to see in me, because if you really knew me, you couldn't like me. And so I develop a pseudo that looks really good, and it's outgoing, it's gregarious, it's smart, it has answers, it's social, those kind of things. But when you, for instance, let's let's look at employment. If you own a big company and you hire someone, you will find that they you you, you uh, give them thirty days probation or sixty to ninety days probation. Let's stretch it out. 90 days probation, and and they can generally make it. But what we found out is the pseudo-personality of a person you hire can only last six months and two weeks. And that this is just uncanny. And what happens is by the time six months, two weeks goes by, they have, they have stretched their pseudo-personality to its limit. And then you find out who you've hired and the attitudes and, and all the stuff that is going on in their life. That And, and you're past the 90 days probation, so now you've got to write them up and pink slip them and have them sign it three times. And then if they're, if they're heavy or, or ethnic or whatever the case may be, then they'll, they'll turn around and sue you, and, and you're in trouble. So I, I, I worked with, with some major uh, computer corporations on the West Coast, and I said, stretch your, your probation period from 90 days to six months and two weeks. And they said, why the two weeks? And I said, because that seems to be the profile that they can hold on to a pseudo-personality, and then finally they can't hang on to it anymore, and you're going to see the real person you're hired, you've hired. And they're defiant. They're late to work by this time. They're coming in late. They try to leave early. They'll they'll take things home because they have this this idea that I'm I'm not getting paid what I'm worth, so I'm going to take home a radio or a hammer or, or a stapler or something like that or some reams of paper or whatever the case may be. They don't like authority. They won't read blueprints. They they're manipulative. They're controlling. Uh, they they do not play as a team player in any way. They will take ideas. I, when I worked in the in the uh, 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 military, you know, Collins Radio and things like that back in my youth, uh, we would sign a paper that if I invented anything uh, on premises, the company owned that invention. And yet when I talked to Hewlett Packard several, oh, it's been a couple, three years ago, and they said, when we started out in Silicon Valley, there were like three computer companies, and they did everything in-house. Now there's 250 suppliers that have invented certain things and, and broken away and taken their whole division or their whole department, and now we have to buy from them. So they, the, the, it boils down that if, I, if I'm arrested in development, 
I'm always looking out for number one, and I will invent something, and then I will I will pull away from the corporation which owns that invention, and uh, and and start my own company because I don't like working for somebody else. So there's all kinds of things in this pseudo personality that you have to watch for when you're hiring people because they look pretty good. You hire the pseudo and end up with the core that's angry and and is collecting injustices and talking behind your back and stealing equipment and all those kind of things. See and, and so you're hiring, they put their best foot forward. They don't come in and, and have recommendations for uh, somebody that's saying, well, this guy is a real wacko and you don't want to hire him, they put their best foot forward. So you're hiring a pseudo and you end up with an angry, arrested development person who feels that the world is unjust because they can't make decisions, so they're all out for number one. And uh, so one of the things that I have been working on for years is a test for human resources that will, you, you give a 20-minute test and run it through the computer and it will it will give you the age of arrest and development and the stage of development in which they are arrested in and, and 40 to 50 issues that you'll be dealing with with this person once probation is over with. Man, that's and, fascinating. And here, if, and here, yeah, I bet, hey, Paul, I bet, I, I bet you won't be popular with people applying for jobs because, again, everybody's in... In a, in in a, in a, what you would say, I would call it a facade mode. You would call it a, you know, best foot forward. Can I ask you a question too? And, and continue. I don't want to interrupt you. But how do you? How have you learned? Because you've had people work for you. I've had people work for me in the, you know, in the last couple months. People I've hired have absolutely, uh, you know, they would put their best foot forward. And you know, recently I found out that uh, that even though I'm the one paying their paycheck and and giving them a job, and in a couple cases, you know, thirty thirty five thousand a year for a starting payment. And uh, two people came to me and said, "You got to do something about this person that you hired, Steve." Uh, and this is not in my metal shop. So finally, I just separated all ties from this company. But how do you personally recommend people deal with betrayal? Because the scripture is very pronounced in the end times and the last days. People are going to betray people. Now, obviously, if you're arresting your development, you're going to filter it. But what what are some of the things, if you would, I, I'm, I'm also getting an email which triggered me in this thinking. Uh, how do you deal with betrayal? Because obviously, in arrested development and adultery, there's betrayal. But there's so much betrayal out there and jealousy and envy that how do you deal with that? I mean, what you know? Let's say let's say you end up as an employer and you don't have your test yet, you know. And and nowadays, if you let someone go for uh, you know anything and you don't document and everything, you get sued. And you, not only do you pay the price in the first place, you pay the price in the second place. Yeah, and that's true, and that's why I'm, I've been working on this test. And I need to get it finished up because I have major corporations who say that that it has to stay in, in human resources, HR, because if it were ever used as a, as a developmental issue in mental health, then there would be discrimination. So it has to stay in. And one of the companies I talked to, I said, You're, we're going to get sued. And they said, if, if, you, if, if this works, it would save us $33 million a year worldwide in hiring the department heads, just that alone. And and give you an example of this. I hired a receptionist and and or I didn't, Judy did, and and I I didn't care for her attitudes in the beginning, but she really worked out. She worked out good for six months and two weeks. And I predicted that. I told Judy six months and two weeks and she's gonna lay down and 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 think she's entitled to everything around here, and she's gonna she's not gonna do the work. And and exactly what I predicted happened: six months and two weeks, and and we ended up having to let her go because she just was worthless as all get out. And she, and and when she made her probation, six months and two weeks was our probation. And when she made her probation, she got up and danced around and said, "Now I can relax because I'm off her probation." And she fell apart. Totally fell apart. And so one of the things that I do when I hire is is I, I try to provoke the person to see how they handle anger. Because if you provoke them and ask questions and dig a little bit, 
they'll start reacting on you, and and they'll get an attitude because what happens is if, if they're arrested in development, one of the biggest things you're going to find is they have an entitlement personality, and they'll hide that for a while. But that entitlement personality says, I'm working too hard and I'm not getting paid, so I'm justified in, in starting to take things home. That will be your, 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 one of your big issues. So if you, if, if you were to talk about how do you handle your anger, and, and, and they have all this great answer, and you say, I just don't believe it. I, I have, I've worked with, with people that have the type of personality you have, and uh, you're, you don't handle your anger like you tell me you're handling your anger. You could really go off and be, be very critical and be maybe even violent in the workplace. And, and they'll start fighting with you, and then you know you're dealing with two personalities. So you, you, press them, you press them into a crisis situation and see how they respond. Because the, the pseudo-personality has a very short fuse. And and, and, and what will happen is they'll say, you're pushing me, and I don't want this job anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, act out. And, and they'll act out on you. And you just tell them, well, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in this kind of a situation. And, and that's, you know, it, it's, it's easy to do. And, Doctor, right. we're, see, we're seeing a whole generation of people uh, being indoctrinated by the public schools of this entitlement attitude. Um, yeah. where the government should provide for them, or they expect that you know the government provides their every need, uh, everything away from self-dependency. And they're not only this is not only being fomented by family problems or history of abuse. This is now being introduced um, to the major to all public schools and curriculum through indoctrination. I know. I know. <laughs> And is is that by design, Doctor? I mean, are they are they playing? When I say they, I mean like are the public officials are they playing on that um, on the on that shame based uh, line of thinking? I mean, is is this by design or is this just by coincidence, accident, and path of least resistance? I mean, what, what, what's what's propelling this? I I think that it's it's by design uh, because I've watched in the public schools where where they're dumbing down the curriculum and not challenging some of the kids like they should. Uh, and and they're, not, they're not getting the best out of the kids. Uh, and, and the other piece of this is you have so many children from broken homes with no dad, so there's no responsibility seen in the home. And that's not just cultural. That's, in, that, that's across the board. We have, as, we have many, many uh, families of, of the Caucasian uh, persuasion that don't have dads either. I mean, it's just uh, you know, mom's raising uh, raising the family, and and uh, and mom's dependent on welfare and dependent on what the kids can do and bring in that type of thing. So it's it's becoming a a multicultural issue that uh, that we need to be taken care of. But it's also a developmental issue. Because if I'm arrested in development and I can't take care of myself, then then I need somebody to take care of me. And that's like in the in the the gangs, you got the Crips and the Bloods and those kind of things. That they come together and they form their own family. I know someone who was was with the one of the gangs in Los Angeles, and he was pretty much the head of the gang. And, and he got out of it and has, has since married and, and found a relationship with Christ and turned his life around. It's like a Nicky Cruz thing. But, but the, the, the family is so disintegrated that the gang becomes the family, and then you have power struggles on the street and those kind of things, but they don't have any stability in their own homes. And so they gravitate and develop a family that they're comfortable with, and that's where the gangs start out. So it's it's a it's a situation of entitlement, arrested development, until by the time everybody gets arrested in development, you 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 got somebody that will step in and uh, and and make nights for everybody and give them everything they think they need, and they'll get voted in and and that's the way it'll be. So it's 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 almost the end of an era of entrepreneurship and those kind of things over a period of time. Uh, 
if we can, let's go back to Steve's question and how the media plays into this through soap operas, TV, entertainment, Hollywood, movies, um, how they are affecting the people um, living under this shame and um, what it's doing to their men mentality. And, uh, you know, like you talked about earlier, the uh, transition from going from one mentality to the other and, and training yourself and, and through help and, and prayer um, I mean, some of these people don't have parents who even believe and who the, no. the Bible is, is alien to them. So how how can we uh, get the attention of these people to understand, you know, that they might have a problem? I don't, I don't know that you can. Um, you look at you look at how how in in your in your comedies you look at how men are looked at. Uh, I, I I think one of the funniest shows in the world was Raymond, and and he had a mother son bond, and and yet Dad was looked at as a as a clown, and Raymond was looked at as a fool, and Raymond's big brother or little brother, whatever he was, was looked at as a as a pompous fool, and all those kind of things, and it was hilarious, but what was the message that you got if you watched that show? On a regular basis, uh, you get into into very, and I don't I don't want to name any of the shows. I thought I loved the Raymond show because it was such a mother son thing. Uh, Raymond was her favorite uh, little boy, and and he played to that. And Raymond's wife was not thrilled with it, <laughs> but uh, we we're seeing, and especially if if there's somebody that 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 they don't write in a godly husband. Uh, into the script anymore. They used to, it, it's not leave it to beaver anymore. And, but what they do is they make a buffoon out of the, the man of the house. And, and that's exactly what, what, uh, the evil one wants us to see, uh, so that it'll become a matriarchal type of, of, uh, community. Uh, and yet it's, it's, uh, there's no stability in that. I still, I still see the family as, as what God said a family is. And Why then? So hey, I, let's go there, Dr. Hagstrom, because one of the things that's so big is the emasculation of the American male. Now, obviously, chemicals play into that as far as, you know, our, our sperm counts are down, and obviously, uh, you know, the genetically modified organisms and all of the uh, xenoestrogens and plastic and all the... Uh, chemicals and the 50,000 secret formulas, et cetera, et cetera. But let's talk about the emasculation of the American male in church, because obviously people, you know, you, you spend a great deal of time counseling guys who come out of the church, and, and i got to share this with you. I have never in my life seen a more, a, a more pronounced, and I'm talking about my personal experience, uh, there was a time in the early 70s and 80s where the men of God were stalwart in their faith, they were strong. They preached the word of God unabashedly. They didn't make excuses for Jesus. They weren't ashamed of Jesus. And all of a sudden, we've got metrosexuals, and we've got, I don't know another word, pretty boy. Now, look, the bottom line is, is that we have the emasculation in the pulpit that carries through to the emasculation in the parishioners that carries through in the effeminacy and the ineffectiveness of men. And, and, and uh, you know, Romy was sharing with me, uh, one of my, my, my dear, dear friends and intercessor, that, that the, the churches now are becoming so openly effeminate that, I mean, you know, listen, there's, in the Old Testament it said, anybody that's wounded in the stones, meaning, you know, as a unit, can't enter into no. the congregation of the Lord. So I'm not going to live in the Old Testament. But will you address that? Because that seems to be the most pronounced thing that in, in the four to 500 emails I get some days, some days it's as low as 200, some days after a big radio show it's more than that, but the, the, the cry of the women's heart, in other words, and let me just be blunt, it seems like the men have allowed the contemporary uh, uh, expression of uh, the lack of manhood, which TV and those devils on TV, the demons that are, that to basically literally rip the gonads off of every male you use Raymond as an instance uh, and, and just the mother 
uh, a son thing, but, I mean, let's address it in the pulpit. Where did that come from, in your opinion? Because you're a minister, uh, you know, you, you have a licensed minister, too. But the point being is, is that it, it's becoming more pronounced now, Dr. Hagstrom. You know, I mean, I, I, what's, what's your take on that? Because in order for men to teach men to be men, you know, I know guys, listen, this is a true story. I won't name names. In Bozeman, their idea of, of men being men in a biblical sense is strapping a six-shooter on their hip, drinking whiskey, and smoking cigars. Now, these are Christians, yeah. okay? Now, yeah. now that is, 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 you know, I don't know if it's based on a, a book or something, but the point is is that will you address that? Because there are men here that really are, are, are wanting to rise up. There are women who have been praying for their husbands, and for the women that have basically got their uh, husbands in a, uh, uh, how do I say this tactfully, in a stranglehold below the belt, they've got to let go and let the men be men, and the men have to rise up to be the men that their wives want them to be. Will you address that issue? It's so critical for this day and hour. It is critical, and I can trace it back because I've been in the domestic violence movement for uh, 30-some years, over 30 years. And back in the early day, the, the church was not allowed to be a part of the treatment programs for men who batter. Uh, it, it, it's like the, the movement and the, the coalitions felt that the church lived the patriarchal system. And, and, and I, I thought this, but I have not been a gladiator and, and making a fool out of myself because I have conservative theories on how men need to be men and what a man, a true man is. And I made the statement years ago that to the women's movement and the feminist movement that Jesus was the greatest gift and honored men and women, and especially women, greater than anyone that you've ever had in, in the movement. Because the, the last miracle that Jesus did, and let me, let me put it this way, he, remember Mary and Martha. He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And, and the body, the, the, the Jewish culture back in his day demanded that he raise somebody from the dead to prove that he was the son of the living God and he wouldn't do it. But what got him crucified was he wouldn't do it for the, the denominations. They had the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all of that, and, and they all fought amongst themselves. Some believed some things and some believed another, so I look at it as it was denominations. And he, wouldn't, he would not raise anybody from the dead to prove to them he was the son of the living God, but he raised Lazarus from the dead because he loved Mary and Martha. And when he, when he prayed before he, he called Lazarus out of the tomb, he says in his prayer uh, in the scripture, and you can read it, that, Father, you and I both know that I can do this, but I'm speaking to you so that they will understand that you're a part of this. I'm paraphrasing it. But he called Lazarus out of the tomb, and then he told the disciples and the people that were there to loose him of the grave clothes. And, and he did it because... He did it for the honor of Mary and Martha, not for the denominational system of his day. And the Pharisees says, this is too much power. We have to kill him. And so that that was the last miracle that Jesus did before the crucifixion, other than putting the ear back on the the soldier that Peter cut off. But other than that, that was the last miracle, and that's what got him crucified. So he did what Mary and Martha did he honored women like nobody had in their day and yet they feel that that in the in the church because of the word the patriarchal system and that type of thing that 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 was a no-no and you couldn't even use that terminology and so when it came to curing domestic violence and and working with perpetrators and that type of thing and remember I was one of those so I know what the church couldn't do for me and, and how I had to develop my own recovery like Bill W., and that's where life skills came from. 
but we life skills honors men. But I won't get in that. I don't have a dog in that fight, and I'm not going to go to the wall and and create sides with the ministry that we have because when we deal with men, we hold men accountable beyond your wildest imagination, but we also lift them up. We don't castrate them. Right, and i got to share that's... something. The, the bravest men, I, I've said this on my radio program for 20 years, Doc, the mightiest men of God I know are women. And I mean that with no put down to yeah. men, but it, it's elevating. See, I'm not threatened by, by women of faith and power and understanding. What I guess I'm trying to get at is, is that the, the, the resting of the development of the men who are in church leads directly to the pulpit. You reproduce what you are. If the if a pastor is always preaching, you know a famous one that preached against a certain sin, pornography and everything, and then got tagged with you know uh, you yeah. know an ugly hooker and and Playboy or some you know, and, and the deal is is that that what I'm trying to get at, I guess, and maybe I'm not clear in asking this, is what do you believe? And this isn't to put anybody down, and I, I'm trying to be as clear as I know how. What is the thing in all the men? That, and maybe it's, it's as plain as arrested development, but what is the thing that you see most in the churches that's keeping the men from becoming who God wants them to be? And, and when you tell me that 80%, and I believe that number, by the way, of preachers are hooked on porn uh, or are having issues with it, then that tells me that something is driving them. Would, would you share that whole thing about how many times an image, the mind can't separate between fact and fantasy after, what, three times? Well, it's 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 worse than that because what happens is, and especially with high definition television. So if you've got high def television or virtual reality, the and and the frames are over two hundred and twenty five frames per second. It's the the pornography then goes into the mind as an as an actual happening. You are part of it. That if you're self gratifying during that pornography, then what goes into the mind is not fantasy anymore, it's reality because the body responds to the self-gratification. So it's very dangerous. And and what happens is after two to three years of of fantasy and, and dealing with pornography like that, using it as self-gratification, the, the man cannot make love to a woman. Because the 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 women in the in the fantasies are airbrushed. A wife can 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 get in competition with a guy with a man's mistress because she has moles and veins and stretch marks and those kind of things. But a wife cannot compete with a, a picture that's been airbrushed and touched up. And and see the the brain is so magnificent that they now have types of, of uh, pornography that you can put on the computer and you can you can change the measurements of the breasts or the thighs or do a close-up or whatever you want to do because it's all interactive. And a wife can, cannot compete with that. That's and unbelievable. So the men then, huh? the, that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah, I, I never heard of that, but okay. Wow. Oh, it's, it's there. Wow. Uh, and, and well, it's yeah, and, and I want to place. share something with you. You know, I think that this is something that people need to understand. One of the greatest pushes for not only artificial intelligence, and just to go on record, those of you who have listened to me for 20 years, this is critical that you understand. The greatest push for uh, true skin and the biggest money being spent is in is from the pornography and uh, you know industry uh, trying to basically create a virtual sexual experience not only where you can feel everything by hooking the right things to the right places but also to download the actual experience of famous people having sex. Now, when I said that years ago, everybody thought I was like, you know, smoking something. But now every single day in the uh, transgenic movement, in the singularity movement, in other words, the combining of machines and men and doing ultimately away with mankind, the, the greatest, and I'm going to share this with everybody because most people don't understand it, it's the push is to create uh, just like Blade Runner, sex bots, okay, S-E-X-B-O-T-S. Now, why is that yeah. critical? 
because it is the alienation and it is the destruction of God's intended best for mankind. So by by denigrating, by adulterating, and by that I'm talking about the genetic change or the implementation of nanotechnology. I mean, what's funny about this, and I'm not saying funny in a funny ha-ha thing, is, is that it goes on in every single program in high def because of the mind, electro, neurological, and electrochemical uh, uh, balance, and that literally, uh, Dr. Hagstrom, Joe, and Doug, this is where the push is on. It is the complete, and by the way, if you take it right down to the, the end, it's the end of mankind, because not only did God create, uh, you know, sex for, for the intimacy, but also for the procreation, and every single New World Order or New Age uh, uh, guru wants to knock down the population of the world by 6 billion people, leaving 500 million, i.e., for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, go uh, Google the Georgia Guidestones. So how then, uh, you know, I guess we got to get everybody in the, in the pulpits to understand the war that is against the men of God, but also the men of God to need to understand that they don't need to be bound by that. But let's face it, the devil knows the best bait. And I came out of that world. I know plenty about it as a filmmaker. You yourself, Paul, were a filmmaker. I was a filmmaker. The bottom line is, is that, that the power of the cinema has changed the values of America, it's changed the perceptions of America, and it's destroying the families in America. And here's the secret of the whole thing. The reason that pornography is so big is because men and women are rested in development and cannot handle a intimate relationship. So they want they want the, the feel good without the responsibility of intimacy, the responsibility of communication, the responsibility of supporting a family, the responsibility of children. I'm arrested in development and I get hooked on this type of a situation because I'm not mature enough to be able to deal with the intimacy of a marriage relationship. It's easier to, and I'm not being crude, but it's easier to have sex and run and to, or turn against the wall or shut off the ma, the machine that you're you're peering into as you're self gratifying. It's easier to do that than to carry the emotional needs of a woman. And in our research, we find that a woman is 10% sexual and 90% emotional. A man is 10% emotional, 90% sexual. And that's why men and women, when they come together in premarital sex. They are not doing the courting and the dating. They're just getting sex and then marrying so they can have a, 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 a sexual relationship anytime they want it. But the mind of a woman is not built that way, and, and she can be that. I mean, she can be a, a sexual being because she's maybe been, been uh, wounded and, and uh, molested or incested when she was a little girl. But the normal woman, even if she's been molested, after she marries, she wants to know, am I loved for who I am or what I am? And so she struggles for a lifetime, and that becomes such a heavy load to a man who's arrested in development. He would rather just go run off a load and, and not have to deal with any kind of intimacy, any kind of coupling, any kind of responsibility. And so that's why pornography is so great today because men and women are both arrested in development in such a low age. They have never made it to the decision-making area of the bar mitzvah and the bar mitzvah in the Jewish culture. So they have never come to a decision-making ability. And so they take the way of least resistance and find that the mature adult-to-adult -adult relationship is too heavy to handle. They want a shortcut. Yeah. Wow. And I'm just looking over here at the numbers uh, of the increase in uh, pornographic Internet sites and the availability of it. It says every second, uh, $3 million plus is spent on pornography. Every second, 28,258 Internet users are viewing pornography. Uh, every second, 372 Internet huh. users are typing adult search terms into search engines. Unbelievable. And this, this trend is is expanding rapidly and growing as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. 
no, no, it's not no. what it was years ago when I was a kid and was introduced to pornography. It's a whole different thing, and that's wow. why they they had. Uh, in fact, uh, Art Bell had on a uh, a, a technical uh, a man that, that that worked in the tech field, and and they uh, they were doing virtual reality, and I tried to buy that show. And and it was it, I I couldn't find what the name of the show was or who it was, but it's been probably twelve thirteen years ago when I heard the show. And what happened is the man realized that his engineers were engineering virtual reality for pornography. And what they did is is they tried body suits and and connections that you were talking about, Steve. But what they yep. did is they actually went in and put a helmet on with nothing touching anything, and it was all done by the by the virtual reality in the brain. And and what happened is they they hired uh, several people that were in pornography, uh, male and female, and and uh, experimented with them. And one of the women. Uh, liked what was happening until she she started responding and 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 couldn't stop responding and the man that de- that developed that virtual reality and using it for aircraft and and that type of thing for training he didn't know this was going on and he walked away from his own company um and and made the statement that that whatever we we engineer for good there's an evil use for it, and he was so disgusted that the, that his engineers had behind his back had done this. And Art interviewed him. I mean, it was like a three-hour show. And and he, the last thing he said is, "I walked away from my company, and and uh, got nothing out of it. Just walked away from it uh, because I didn't want to be a part of of that type of of situation." But they they found out you didn't have to have a body suit with electrodes on it. You could you could use a helmet and and train the brain to respond to virtual reality. It was that real. Right, and let's 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 put the word pornography. It comes interesting. You mentioned uh, you know the Temple of Diana, the Greek temple, and 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 it comes from two words in Greek. The first is porne, meaning harlot, and obviously uh, graphene, g r a p h e i n. Uh, meaning to write. In other words, pornography is literally the writing of harlots. And isn't it interesting that in the book of Revelation, you know, Mystery Babylon is a mother of harlots. Okay, now remember, the word pornography, ladies and gentlemen, means the writing of harlots. And the interesting thing is, is Mystery Babylon, which I believe we, the United States is Mystery Babylon, are the ones that export. uh, And Joe, you gave out the statistics. And I think in 1970, the porn industry was about a hundred million, and now it's in the multi billions. But it's fascinating, is it, that the country that exports the most pornography, America, is called in the Book of Revelation the mother of harlots. And harlotry and pornography go hand in hand. Now, I think that's fascinating. Yeah, oh, yeah. because it, it's so defining the time we live in, you know, and I knew that, that you know, uh, basically, uh, I knew what graphy meant, but I, and I, I, I remembered that, you know, basically it means to sell the writing of Harless or to sell the images, the word graph, photograph, okay, autograph, it's a writing or it's a, it, it's a picture or an emblem, and the thing is, is that when you take it back to what Dr. Hagstrom said about an hour ago on this show, the way God created the spiritual center of the brain and the sexual, I'll just call it, you know, the sexual part of the brain, they're so close and linked and one was meant to protect the other, but now these people have got it down to a science. And, and, and Dr. Hagstrom, I believe that it is designed to block us out, uh, block not only men out, but it's to block out the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the communication of the Holy Spirit, and Paul says there are so many sounds in the world, there's so many voices, and they all have effect. And now I think yeah. it's interesting because because in the Middle Ages they used to say, you remember this, the monks used to say on your right side you had an angel whispering in your ear, and on the left side you had a devil, or maybe I've got the sides, you know? Well, now you're continually bombarded with not only that which the ears can hear through the auditory uh, canal, but also through the infrasonic 
the realm of the unspoken word, or basically it's it's mind control. And I think it, it only gets deeper and deeper from here. It only gets worse and worse until ultimately, again, the wonderful words of Jesus come to pass. If the Lord didn't shorten the days, there'd be no flesh left alive. That literally means that humanity would destroy itself under the influence of hell and the devil. No, no. Now let me let me let me throw in a, a, a punchline. I was deep into pornography, but and, and and I was arrested in development, so it was easier to deal with pornography than it was to deal with a real woman because she has needs and wants commitments and all those kind of things. But when I when God had me develop this program and I started to mature and I started to grow up. I was able to walk away from the pornography and develop a relationship with the wife. And I can tell you that that God delivered me from pornography totally to the point that that I don't and I I don't spend much time at all on the internet. But I've never had a pop up. I've never had not one nasty picture on my computer in the last 30 years. And again, I'm not on the I'm not on the internet, and I'm not cruising around and, and getting accidentally uh, something on my screen. It just doesn't happen. But I have no desire whatsoever. I mean, when I grew up emotionally, and and I I I was able to make choices. I was able to say no. I am not going that route, and I rebuke that thought. And I and and and, uh, and I did my work. I I I met business with God, and I did my work. And and you can be delivered from pornography. And that's the message I want everybody to understand. If you want to be free from it, God can deliver you from pornography. Dr. Yeah, Anthony, and we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're, pray for people too. Yeah, uh, we're coming up against a break. We're gonna hit on this on the other side. I got. A, so many questions about this and some other things. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report on the special Saturday edition, October 27, 2012, with Dr. Paul Hegstrom and Steve Quayle. We'll be back after these short messages for the third and final hour. Stay with us. You're not going to want to miss it. <laughs> 